Thank you. Uh, now we turn to Professoressa Nuria Kalduk Benages. She is Secretary for the Pontifical Biblical Commission and Head of the Department of Biblical Theology here at the Gregorian University and a regular invited professor to the Biblical Institute this, this semester teaching a course on Lady Wisdom in Ben Sira. Most recently, she was elected to the Academia Scienciarum et Artium Europei, where she attended last week the ceremony of her induction into the Academy in Salzburg, Austria. Congratulations. <laughs> She is a recognized uh, expert in Ben Sira, and so we are now going to listen to her on historical sociology, the society behind the book of Ben Sira, Nuria. So, <clears throat> thank you very much for this kind introduction. And I go immediately to the text because the time has to be respected. Okay, we're, we're running just a few <laughs> minutes late. Everybody can be a little patient. We might go to 10 minutes after 6 for the conference, and then we'll have 20, 25 minutes of questions. Please, we don't yeah. want to rush anybody. No, 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 no. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the title is this one, Historical Sociology, the Society Behind the Book of Ben Sira. How does an investigation of the society reflected in the book of Ben Sira contribute to the interpretation of the biblical text? This is the question that the organizers of this Congress have asked themselves and then graciously proposed to me. Now my task is to give, or try to give, a convincing answer by considering at least one text. I have prepared three but we will focus only uh, on one text. Ben Sira wrote in Jerusalem circa 185 BCE, and some years later, probably between 132 and 117, his work was translated into Greek, allegedly by his grandson, according to the prologue. The passage I will consider is the first one that you see on the slide, Sira 9, 17, 10, 18, about the rulers and the sin of pride. Although, as a general rule, Ben Sira does not identify specific persons or political events, the attentive reader, with the help of historical sociology and information gathered from external sources, can detect the features of the turbulent times in which the sage lived. The conflicts between Ptolemies and Seleucids, as well as the internal fights in Judea involving the Tobiats and the Oniats, are crucial to understand this book. The first problem we encounter when trying to reconstruct the society in which Vencira lived is the scarcity of available sources. We have practically no information about Judea and Jerusalem in the years between the third and second century BCE. Lester Grabe writes in his History of the Jews and Judaism in the Second Temple period, here we have the quotation, we have probably less information than for Achaemenid rule. There is a real question as to whether one can write the history of Judah under Ptolemaic rule, since our knowledge of specific events for the century and a quarter between Alexander and Seleucid domination is so skimpy. In fact, the best witness to this period of the history of Israel is the book of Ben Sira itself. For this reason, the scholars who have studied the sociology of Judah of Jerusalem in Ben Sira's times have done it on the basis of a careful reading of the book. I can quote the, the work of Theophil Middendorf, Die Stellung Jesu Ben Sira's Zwischen Judentum und Hellenismus in 1973, and then the book of Oda Vishmaya, the, Die Kultur des Buches Jesus Sirach in 1995. But 
let's mention the most recent ones. Richard Horsley and Patrick Tiller with their essay, Vencida and the Sociology of the Second Temple, 2002, and Jeremy Corley, Sociology of Vencida's Patriarchal Society, Textual and Papyrological Perspective, Still on Press, which is due to appear before 2020, next year. In his essay, besides the textual evidence from the book, Corley has used the Greek papyri coming from the archive of Zenon in the mid third century as a source of socio-historical background for Bensida's era. In addition to his investigation of what can be gleaned from these records, Corley also pays special attention to the status of women in society. It's a topic in which I am very much interested. Yeah. According to him, I quote, the sage exhibits almost no interest in the experiences of women. Thus, a significant aspect of Vencida's sociology is, as of other Greco-Roman authors, the overwhelmingly male perspective. To put it in the words of Horsley and Tiller, women have generally been hidden from history. End of quote. Though different from many points of view, the two above mentioned essays utilize, with some adaptations and revisions, the comparative historical sociology of Gerhard Lenski in their analysis of Bensida's society. In Power and Privilege, from 1966, one of the most important contributions to social stratification theory made in the 20th century, Lenski assembles data on all the types of societies that have existed throughout world history and ranks them by the degree of economic inequality found in them. His categories are hunter-gatherer, horticultural, agrarian, and industrial societies. According to Lemsky, an agrarian society such as the Jerusalem city-state in which Vencida lived has a very small upper class and a large lower class with an enormous social chasm between them. For this type of society, Lemsky proposes a model of social stratification composed of seven basic groups. The governing class, the associated retainers, the peasant farmers, the artisans, the merchants, the degraded, and the expendables, those who are the most destitute members of the group. Horsley and Tiller reduced these basic groups to four, and Corley focus on just three layers, the governing class, the skilled workers, and the poor. Lenski's grid cannot give a complete and accurate picture of the social structure of Jewish Palestine in the Hellenistic era at the time of Ben Sira. This is obvious. A frequent criticism raised against Lenskin's model is that his separation of the priestly class, uh, the priest, mm, uh, the governing class and the retainer class does not take into account the fact that in the late Second Temple period, Judea was essentially a temple state in which the priests uh, were part of more than one social class. Yeah. They were uh, in the rulers, there was uh, also in the government class, also in the retainer class. Yeah. Nevertheless, I think that Lemsky's model of a stratification is a very useful tool that helps to better understand the text, or at least, as Corley says, to focus the discussion. Here are the texts that uh, I should, I mean, deal with, but as I said, we remain with the first one. Yeah? The one uh, contemporary person from the ruling class whom Ben Sira names in his book is the high priest Simon II, son of Aeneas II, for whom the sage feels great admiration. Simon is clearly a hero for him, 
in Benjamin Wright's words. Simon II was a key figure in the politics of his time and most likely the leader of the faction that supported the Seleucids. Bensira dedicates a poem of 22 verses to him as the climax of his hymn to the ancestors in Sira 4450, where he praises him not only for his liturgical service, but also for the repair and fortification of the temple and the walls of Jerusalem that had been damaged during the struggles between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. As Horsley and Tiller rightly observe, I quote, why idealized in the grandest fashion, the picture Ben Sira sketches in the paean of praise to the high priest Simon, nevertheless, reflects the basic social structure. In fact, the high priest was at the head of Jerusalem society in the early second century BCE, under the political authority of the Seleucid king and his military commander. In Ben Sira's poem, Simon, Surrounded and assisted in ruling by the inner concentric circle, as you see, of his brothers, the aristocracy among the sons of Aaron, who are in turn surrounded and supported by the outer concentric circle of the people, the whole congregation of Israel. According to these authors, in Ben Sira's systems of signs, at least, the high priesthood subsumes the functions of the other offices, particularly the teaching function of Moses and the political economic functions of the king. As evidenced in the hymn of praise, there was no structural differentiation of a separable political, economic, and religious institutions such as that found in modern Western societies. Judging from the book, Ben Sira does not show any political preferences. Certainly, he was an active member of society. But unlike the high priest, he was not personally involved in the power struggles from which he preferred to keep his distance. We could describe his attitude as peaceful, moderate, and above all, I would say, prudent. Although Ben Sira's main concern and activity in his writing was not politics, but the formation of the young, reading between the lines will enable us to discover some veiled allusions to the political situation of his time. The only text, as far as I know, in which this sort of allusion becomes very apparent is the prayer of Sira 36.117, where using the first person plural, Ben Sira pleads with God to punish the nations. So, you know, if you remember the text, when said, raise your hand against the foreign folk, eh? humble the enemy, scatter the foe, eh? is a very dramatic uh, prayer. No doubt the enemies of Israel or here the Seleucid overlords. This prayer could be considered as an as an exception to Ben Sira's ordinary practice of not taking sides in the social and political controversies of his day. So let's have a look to the text. Sira 9, 17, 10, 18 refers to the first group according to Lenskin's model of stratification of agrarian societies, so the governing the ruling class. And can be, this text can be uh, considered as a treatise of government, whether local or foreign, divided in two parts, more or less, uh, one on the rulers and another one on their main danger, I mean, pride. Yeah? Here we have the translation of manuscript A, yeah? the Hebrew manuscript A, that places the ruling class in a theological context. The government of the world is in the hand of the Lord, who raises up on it the ruler at the proper time. Human success is in the hands of the Lord, who confers honor on the lawgiver. In these verses, Ben Sira does not seem to be particularly critical of the political situation in which he lives. Instead of naming the rulers of his time, he raises his discourse to the theological level. It is God who establishes the ruler at the right time, and it is he who grants glory to the lawgiver. 
Although the text does not mention it, some see in these lines a veiled reference to the arrogance of the Hellenistic rulers, Ptolemies and Seleucids, who considered themselves to be gods and consequently wanted to be treated as such. The text itself does not reveal whether this was Ben Sira's intention, but if it was, his allusion to arrogance of the pagan kings are sufficiently veiled so as not to get him in trouble, in case, yeah? you never know. In the next section on pride, Ben Sira is critical of the damage done by the rulers who recognize no power greater than themselves. Here is the verse in question. Dominion passes from one people to another because of violence and arrogance. For some authors, Ben Sira's allusion to the succession of empires is of a generic nature, something that is repeated in the history of all peoples, including Israel. In my opinion, however, Ben Sira refers here to the Battle of Paniers near the sources of the Jordan in 90, uh, 199. Thanks to the victory of Antiochus III over the Egyptians, Palestine passed from the Ptolemies of Egypt to the Seleucids of Syria. I agree here with Benjamin Wright's observation, I quote, with such a momentous event in the not too distant past, I find it hard to think that Ben Sira did not intend this as a reference to that time. I imagine that anyone reading his book would have understood it that way also. End of the quotation. In the following verses, the sage shows how the fragility of human life and the implacable limits of illness and death should humble the pride of any person even that of the highest rulers in society. You can read the short text. How can dust and ashes behave proudly, even during a person's life, his body decays? A long illness mocks the physician. He who is king today will die tomorrow. When a person dies, he or she inherits worms and maggots, vermin and creeping things. It is likely that Ben Sira alludes in verse 10 to another historical event, that is, the mysterious death in Egypt of Ptolemy IV, Philopator, in 203. According to some ancient sources, Polybius, for instance, he died of a terrible and very painful illness resulting from a dissolute life. Others think of the death of Antiochus III, in 183, but according to Diodorus Siculus, Strabo, Justin, the king died while trying to plunder the temple of Elymais, so it doesn't fit very well. Others, hmm, others well, not others, one, uh, <laughs> a very a colleague of mine, thinks that uh, Bensira may even have been thinking of Alexander the Great, who died unexpectedly at the age of 32, 33, in the year 323. The ancient sources, Diodorus Siculur, Arian, Plotarchus, disagree whether he had a fever or whether he had been poisoned. But his passage from the heights of Roland power one day to the depths of the grave the next is a perfect illustration of Ben Sira's poem. Let's go to the final verses. The final verses describe God's judgment of the proud rulers, anticipation, anticipating the destruction of the nations, that is, the foreign powers who were harassing the Jews during Ben Sira's lifetime, and that we find in the prayer that I have quote, mentioned before in Sira 36, the prayer for deliverance of Israel. So the message is crystal clear. The mighty and proud will have to leave their place to the meek and humble. The thrones of the arrogant, God overturns and enthrones the humble in their stead. 
uh, in Greek, because this is not, we don't have it in Hebrew, the roots of the proud God plucks up to plant the lowly in their place. The last traces of the proud God sweeps away and digs out their roots from the subsoil. He plucks them from the earth and roots them out and effaces the memory of them from among men. Insolence is not allotted to a human, not impudent anger to one born of woman. Although this entire passage could have as its historical background the conquest of Canaan and the continuous salvific interventions of God in favor of his people throughout its history, some scholars see here an allusion to the Syrian wars between Ptolemies and Seleucids that afflicted the territory of Syria and Palestine for more than a century. Cherry Cover, yeah, the historian Cherry Cover, thinks in particular of the Fifth Syrian War. This could be perhaps too much precision. Yeah? So, what to say? This we skip. Eh? This I like it very much, but we have to skip it. What to say uh, regarding to the historical eh, uh, sociology? First, I borrow this uh, paragraph from Horsley and Tiller. Historical reconstructions of Judean society under the Hellenistic empires must make critical use of historical sociology to help put our sources into proper perspective without allowing a sociological model, acknowledged or unacknowledged, to determine our reading. We must seek to understand the political and the social implication of religious rhetoric. Understanding, and I conclude, understanding the social and political turmoil in Jewish Palestine in Ben Sira's day unquestionably adds depth and color to the theological insight of this sage. Although he must have been thinking of the recent history of his people and current events within his own society, he sought understanding on a higher level that we may apply to our own history and social controversies today. Thank you very much. <laughs>